HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Broadcasting live from Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn, you're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.com. It is Thursday, 1 o'clock, and once again, you have tuned in to the Heritage Radio Network. We're coming to you live from the back of Roberta's in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn. You're listening to The Farm Report, and I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. Today, we are on the line with Jamie Jones of the Jones Family Farm. Jamie, thanks for joining us today. Oh, no problem. Glad to be here. Yeah, and I'm glad to learn a little bit more about the amazing Jones Family Farm. We had your dad on last week, so please send our hellos. And um, I wanted to kind of start out by talking a little bit about how um, you got into farming. I mean, obviously, growing up uh, on the farm was a big (laughs) factor there. But did you always know that that was going to be the path for you? Or did you, you know, take a little bit of a a journey away from home and come back? What did that look like? Well, growing up on the farm, I, I don't think I ever considered doing anything else other than wanting to be a farmer. So, I mean, <clears throat> as long as I remember, I was always working and helping on the farm. Um, when it came time in, in high school to decide where I wanted to go to college, I decided I wanted to study agriculture, and uh, I was fortunate to graduate uh, from Cornell University with a degree in plant science, basically centered on coming back to the family farm. And that's, that's what I did, and after graduation, I've, I've been here ever since. Now, when you were uh, a student up at Cornell, can you tell us a little bit, like, what are some of the different concentrations uh, can someone pursue if they're, if they're interested? I mean, was it always clear that plant science was the way to go, or did you have trouble picking? Um, well, in my opinion, I mean, Cornell is an absolutely wonderful university, and the reason, besides agriculture, I was attracted to that school was just the, the great diversity of classes that they offered. And I kind of joke, you know, I kind of almost had like a pre-farm major, and my advisor allowed me to kind of pick and choose the classes that would most help me when I returned to the family farm. So in amongst the plant science and vegetable crop production and pomology classes, I was able to take some uh, business management classes and all the other kind of, you know, you know, accounting, the things that are going to, you're going to need instruction and to be a, not just a su- successful farmer, but also, you know, farming is running a business, so you need to, you know, know about everything that that involves also. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit more about that uh, farm transition piece in the second half of the show, but um, one more question about school while we're on the topic. Your classmates, I mean, did you find that the other people in your program were prim- primarily from farm families like yourself, or were there students who came kind of fresh to the program with no real farming history? Uh, there was some of both, and um, it, it, it's kind of amazing. I mean, I graduated from Cornell in the, uh, 1998, so I was there in the mid to late 90s. And uh, there was a handful of us uh, who, who, who very much came from the family farm and knew we were going to go back there. And there was a, a handful of, of students who were, you know, from 
say, less agricultural backgrounds, but, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in it. But um, I, I can tell you, and just the, the te- from the, the 98 from when I graduated till now, I, I've just seen a much greater interest in people from, you know, non-agricultural backgrounds getting back into, into farming. So it's, it's, it's a, rel- a relatively short time frame, but it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, this, this movement by others, uh, because, like I say, at the time I was at school, there were some, but I, I, I know there's more now than there was before. Yeah, I mean, then that's definitely like the sense that I, I've been getting just by talking to people coming through the show here is like there's this real upswell, um, you know, as far as the next generation of farmers uh, in the Northeast and I think across the country are going to be this collection of, of folks like yourself who are, are you know, transitioning to kind of full takeover at some point of their of their parent or grandparents or in your case, I think, great, great grandparents operation. And then folks who are coming into into the industry uh you know from the totally different sets of backgrounds and experiences so it'll be cool how that shapes you know the way the the land and the food system looks over the next you know couple of decades but one of the things your dad mentioned on the show last week is that each of the kind of succeeding generation of jones boys brings something new onto the farm and he alluded to the fact that your passion has been grape so maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you stumbled into that and and what's happening at the farm with regards to that sure i mean i do think that that is one of the things that's made our farm successful because each generation has brought somewhat of a new enterprise to the farm and that's allowed the newer generation to have you know manage something new and you just if if you don't change, you you know you just get outdated. And by by adding a uh, dimension that's that's new and exciting, it's it's made our farm you know persevere. So uh, and really, I have Cornell to again thank for the um, the vineyard and winery aspect of it. Uh, Cornell being located in Ithaca, in the the bottom of Lake Cayuga, I had never planned to go and learn about a vineyard and winery, winery business when I went there. But I was certainly exposed to it, uh, just seeing the family farms up and down the Finger Lakes, recognizing a lot of them were fruit farms like ourselves, but they had diversified into the vineyard business. And then adding a value-added product such as wine was, uh, was further away to expand their business. So it really wasn't until I got back to the farm that I really started to serious con- seriously consider you know, starting a, a family winery here. And it took some time to get it going, but experimenting with grapes and, and a wine production uh, facility development, um, you know, it's worked out quite well for us. That's great. So when you, when you, you know, kind of return to the farm and, and you first have this idea to pursue, um, you know, the development of a vineyard, what were, you know, what are some of the things that you realized you kind of needed with regards to, you know, land um, size and placement within the property? And then how did you decide, you know, what types of grapes to grow? Well, I mean, my, my parents were, were always very supportive. And uh, right after I graduated, my father said, well, here's an acre of land um, that, you know, the, that wasn't, it actually had blueberries growing on at the time, but they weren't very productive because the the site was uh, kind of overly well drained for the blueberries, and seemed like it would be inclined for producing uh, grapes. So back in 90, 1999, I, I planted an, an acre of a vineyard, and it was kind of just a a, a, a grandiose experiment because I planted probably fifteen or twenty different varieties in that to uh, to see what was going to grow well, you know, in my particular area and and also it, it enabled me to kind of experiment and learn the the culture of growing grapes because um despite coming from a plant science background i, I never was never had the opportunity to even take a viticultural course while at cornell so i, I kind of had to learn on the fly but being uh experienced with with growing things it, it wasn't uh too too difficult to uh figure out how to how to you know get them going and after a few years of experience, uh, seeing what varieties did best here, I was able to ex- start uh, expanding and adding more acreage of the vineyard. So when you when you begin like first planting, I mean, are you putting a seed in the ground, or is it a cutting, or how do how do you start, and then how long you know from that point to the point where you're producing grapes? Um, with grapes, what you're, what you're usually, what you are starting out with is, if it's a vinifera grape, it's a, uh, a kind of a grafted cutting where you've got, you know, the, 
the rootstock and then the cyan, which is, you know, the classic variety. You know, people recognize Merlot or Cabernet Franc or Chardonnay or Pinot Gris. Um, and you're just planting, and they really just look like a little stick with roots on the bottom of them. And uh, you're planting them, you know, in the spring, right about now uh, through April. And it's generally in the third year you're going to start getting a production of, of fruit, and then probably another year from when you harvest your fruit till the winemaking process. So it's a good it's a good four year you know wait you know from planting till uh, you're able to actually have a tangible uh, product in, in hand from the from your vineyard. Well, I guess that's a, one of the benefits uh, of being part of you know a, a working farm is that you're able to take kind of a smaller plot to to experiment with things like that and also just kind of have the luxury of of time where you can you know have that space and not needing to be generating income from it um so when when you get that kind of first harvest of fruit i mean is there something you know is it is it like the first couple of years are are great and then production falls off and and you end up kind of constantly replanting or is there something to the age of the vineyard that imparts different characteristics to the wine in addition to just kind of the the terroir of of the soil and the climate where you're at well well certainly you know um Hopefully, as a grower, once you get your your vineyard up to production, you're going to have a um, a constant level of production each year. Of course, the the climate and weather variables can can dramatically affect that. But you're you're usually depending on the variety, you're going to target a certain you uh, usually tonnage or pounds per acre uh, that you're going to want to get. Uh, it, it is when you get into the the nuances of winemaking. A lot of people do believe, and there is some truthful that once once you have a more established vineyard, the the ultimate quality of your wines uh, may begin to be more improved and more refined. But um, uh, that's often there is a role in that. But ultimately, you know, the climate and the weather is, is the the major dictator of um, you know what the what the type of wines will be. From each season. Yeah, and I suppose you can make the assumption that someone who has a, a 20, 25 year old vineyard has also been, you know, growing and making wine for a number of years. So I'm sure the skills of, you know, farming and wine production play a big role there. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ab- absolutely. I mean, every year you learn something new. I mean, obviously, last year's growing season with uh, tropical storms and heavy rains through the fall were, were, were quite challenging, but that was followed on the heels of uh, 2010, which was in the eastern United States, probably considered about the finest year that we've ever had for uh, vineyard production with just, you know, sunshine all summer and fall along. So you, I guess that's, you just, you never know what you're going to get. Exactly. So uh, how are you feeling about this year? I know it was kind of such a crazy winter turning into a weird spring. I have heard some some people feeling like a little concerned for fruit growers with the cold temperatures this week after having such such warm temperatures. Is that a concern for you at all? Uh, very much so. I, I was just say how I feel. I feel nervous. Um, it's you know we're, we're certainly ahead of where we normally are at this point. Um, if you can promise me that we're not going to get freezing temperatures for uh, the rest of the spring, then things will work out just fine. But. Uh, that's not necessarily probably going to be the case. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see this kind of recent more cooling trend will certainly slow things down. And uh, just kind of just wait and see and just hope we don't get any real, real cold weather uh, in later in April or early May because a lot of the uh, perennial fruit crops, uh, whether it be, you know, apples, um, berries, or even vineyard, you know, a lot of those, Many of those crops are going to be uh, sensitive to, uh, you know, freezing temperatures if they get, uh, you know, tender new growth out there. So we're, we're, we're just kind of keeping our fingers crossed right now. So are there any tools aside from, you know, just kind of uh, keeping your fingers crossed? I mean, I feel like I've seen kind of like romantic old movies set in Italy where, you know, there's threat of a frost and, and the vineyard owners like build fires and have fans and kind of this whole elaborate you know, attempt to warm the air in, in the region of the vineyard. Is that like a Hollywood thing, or is that something people actually do? Uh, no, that, that's very much the case of what you do. There's, a, there's several ways to mitigate against a frost. Um, at our farm, especially for the strawberries, which are especially prone to frost once they start to blossom, all of our fields are set up with overhead irrigation. 
So once the temperature drops below freezing and they've reached a point in, you know, they're starting to flower or their buds are exposed, you can turn on your, your irrigation pumps and sprinkle water on the crop. And by the water freezing, it's going to release heat and keep that, keep that temperature at uh, 32 degrees and uh, prevent the, the blossoms from freezing and, and losing your, your, your crop. So that, that same technique can be empl- employed on other crops. There are wind machines, as you mentioned, uh, that, um, you know, if you're out, uh, let's see, Connecticut, there's not too many, but certainly other areas, these big, whether they're vineyard or orchards, and, and that's to kind of move the air and kind of stir it up. And also, as you mentioned, they're called smudge pots, or people can start fires. Um, and then those are all effective when you have a um, kind of a, a frost, a radiational frost. But um, at this point, a lot of those techniques aren't going to be effective for the time of year we are, late March or early April. If you get like a deep, hard freeze when the temperatures are going to drop into the, the low 20s or maybe even the upper teens, um, it, when you have that extreme of a temperature drop, you're probably not going to be able to mitigate against uh, the damage with, with those uh, either watering or wood moving techniques. All right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Um, so I want to get into a little bit more of, of what, the, what the grapes look like closer to harvest. But I think uh, before we do, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll bring you back on to follow up on what's happening in the vineyard. following program has been brought to you by Whole Foods Market. You may have noticed that one Whole Foods Market store is not like the other. We're proud that each of our stores has its own quirks, a direct connection to the surrounding community, and buys and sells their own products. Whether it's artisanal chocolates exclusive to Bowery, small batch pickles in Chelsea, or a featured craft beer on tap at West 97th, you'll find that each store is a little bit different than the next. With six Manhattan locations, Whole Foods Market offers a taste of every neighborhood. Come see us in Tribeca, Bowery, Union Square, Chelsea, Columbus Circle, or the Upper West Side. Open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. For more information, visit www.wholefoodsmarket.com. All right, we're bringing it back. You are tuned into the Farm Report. Just a little tribute to uh, Earl Scruggs, who passed away this morning, the famous uh, three-finger banjo plucker. Uh, we're all feeling a little bit sad today um, regards to that loss, but um, want to give him a little shout-out. We are on the line with Jamie Jones of the Jones Family Farm, and we are talking grapes. So, Jamie, um, can you give us? So, you said that the the, the plantings will happen and the uh, in the early spring, and then throughout the summer, you know, you're kind of taking care of of the growing process and making sure that the grapes are developing nicely. And then, how do you know when it's time to harvest? Well, there's. Uh a lot of different methods. I mean, it's at some point you you just taste them, and when they taste right, um, that's that's a pretty big key. But you you are you're looking at a couple of things. You're monitoring the sugar levels and the acid levels for for wine production, and um, you know once once for the particular variety they get to where you want them to be, then you know you're within that harvest window. And then at least in, in our part of the world, you always got an, an eye to the sky and the, and the weather. Because when once the grapes are getting really ripe, they're going to be more susceptible to um, you know rot or diseases. So if you knew you had a big storm coming the end of the week uh, and your grapes were getting near or just about ripe, you you probably would make that decision to harvest versus if you knew you had a nice stretch of, of 
good weather coming, you might let them, you know, hang on the vine a little bit longer uh, in order to pick up additional ripeness or flavors. So it's very much there's a, a lot of a lot of things you're kind of looking at and paying attention to, you know, that goes into when that uh, decision will be to harvest. And then, do you? I mean. Are you making a different decision for different parts of of the vineyard, or when you're harvesting, it's just kind of all hands on deck and you're go? Yeah, you're, and again, of course, we're part of a diversified farm, and also kind of your labor plays a role in that because we're hand harvesting everything. But uh, usually, we've got a, several different varieties, and you know, some of the the white varieties ripen mid to late September, and the red varieties are going to hang on till uh, mid or even late October. So you've got a you know several different harvest windows, and, and usually a day or two of, of picking, and you you've, you've finished picking the block that we have ready, and then you, it could be a week or two. You wait until the next the next block is ready for harvest. And block is that a term that I mean? Does that mean like a particular amount of space, or that's just kind of the sections that you guys have on your particular farm? It's kind of just a you know whether a block field. You know, it's, it's probably several different you know names. But you know, when I say a block, it's in each of our blocks is you know some are you know an acre, two acres, and some are you know a fraction of an acre. So and, and a lot of them they're dictated just by kind of the topography of the land and what makes sense to uh, plant in that particular area. So when it comes to harvest time, you said you guys are ha- harvesting everything on hand. So how, I mean, how many people does that take? What does that operation look like? Are you loading up, you know, little baskets or, I mean... W- uh, for at least harvesting the grapes, um, certainly when we know I've got a big harvest day, you know, it's, it's, it's all, you know, the, the, our regular farm staff will all pitch in. It's usually all hands on deck. Um, how we harvest, we harvest them into what are boxes, which we call in the grape industry usually lugs. They hold approximately 30 pounds of grapes. Um, usually a harvest, you fill a box. It usually takes uh, two to three uh, uh, grape vines or, or grape plants in order to fill a box. And once they're filled, they're usually left in the row, and then we uh, drive through with a, a tractor behind it carrying some larger boxes called, uh, we call macro bins, and we dump into them, and they they hold between a thousand and two thousand pounds. We fill those up, and in those, then we uh, deliver them to the winery. So, you you know, being that there was no kind of existing wine production facilities there, you not only had to cultivate and build up the vineyard, but you also built up the the winery. How did you kind of know what to do? I mean, what informed your decisions there? <laughs> Well, you, you you figure things out, um, but yeah, that's right. You certainly, I just had to you know visit a lot of other wineries, see see how they did it there, and uh, you know learn learn on the fly, really. Um, so, um, but yeah, you, yeah, you're like at some point you just got to do it, you just, right? <laughs> you just got to figure it out, and uh, you you learn from your mistakes. So the winemaking process, I mean, again, hearkening back to the romantic movies that I seem to be watching a lot of lately, um, I'm assuming you guys aren't, like, dumping the grapes into, you know, a big swimming pool and having, like, women from the village come and stomp on them. Um, But maybe you are. Um, What's kind of, like, (laughs) the next step? Not quite. That is indeed romantic. (laughs) Um, No, we uh, we bring them to the wine. It kind of depends, um, you know, the, the variety and how you want to handle it. Uh, generally, the white grapes get delivered immediately to the winery. Um, where, where we start doing is called whole cluster pressing, so they're immediately put into a, a the press where they're squeezed and the juice comes out, and then the juice is pumped into uh, tanks where it's chilled uh, and it's what's called allowed to settle to allow the sediment to come out. And uh, then it's uh, in a process called racking. You take that juice once it's uh, clear pump it to another tank, let it start to warm back up again, inoculate it with a yeast, and uh, stand back and let the wine happen. And then the red, the red grapes are handled a little bit differently. You're going to take them to the winery. Then it's going to, what's going to call, you're going to destem them. And when you run them through a crusher to stemmer, and we, we're not really trying to crush them too much because we're working on more whole berry fermentations right now. Um, but we, wanted, we do want to remove the stems from it. And uh, those berries come off of the, um, you know, the kind of the, the, um, the cluster that they're held to, and uh, they, they drop into those large bins, and that's 
and once the the stems have been removed, then we add the yeast. You ferment them on the skins for one to two weeks, and then you press them. And from there, they're going to be aged in the uh, wooden wooden caskets or, or barrels that everyone's so familiar with. Wow. So what happens with kind of the, the spent grapes or the, the, the stems? I mean, is there an outlet for that? Uh, the, the 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 skins and yeah the stems and all that they just go in the the uh, compost pile and um, you know they you know you compost them for a year or two and then eventually they're usually spread back on a field somewhere. Well, I know that you you know mentioned you know the the wine uh, when it's ready goes into wooden barrels. I know that's kind of uh, a choice. It seems like between uh, aging the wine in a particular type of wooden barrel or, or stainless steel. Uh, is that right? That's correct. It, it, there's a lot of, again, you know, there's a huge amount of diversity in, in winemaking and philosophy and how you want to do it. But in general, all of our whites are only stainless. They only see stainless steel. And uh, that's what, that's uh, not that some whites can't be aged in oak, but we're only putting our red wines in oak barrels. And uh, we're aging our, our reds and oaks for, you know, six, six months to a year, depending on the wine. And then, of course, there's a huge variation in the types of, of oak barrels, uh, enough to make your head spin. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we, use, we use some American oak. We were trying some Hungarian oak this year, something different. There's French oak. We, we use a little bit of that. And uh, there's hybrid barrels. And, and then the level of uh, toasting uh, on the inside of the barrel also is going to impact the, the flavors of the wine. Now, when you're looking at investing in in these barrels, um, do you do you buy them new? Are they custom made? Is it better to get some that have 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 a few years under their belt? I mean, what what do they look like? And if you can give us a sense, what what would one cost? Uh, uh, the cost of a wine barrel? Yeah, um, they range anywhere from four hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, and it really it really varies on you know what you want. I mean, our winery. We're not large enough, you know, we buy, a, you know, half a dozen or so barrels a year. I mean, some of the larger wineries, you know, could be probably buying hundreds of them where they can probably get, you know, individual contracts uh, for certain types or certain styles. Um, but we're basically, I just look around and, you know, find barrels that I feel are going to, you know, meet the needs of, uh, you know, our production styles. Sure, sure. And uh, how, how big is a barrel and how much wine are you guys producing? Uh, in general, a barrel is 225 liters, uh, which translates into, I think, about 58 or 59 gallons. And in total, we're producing about 3,500 cases of wine a year, and that case has about 12 bottles in it. So we're, we're still a relatively small winery. And is the, what, what are the plans for the future? I mean, are you looking to just kind of concentrate on refining that existing production level or you're looking to grow that to be uh, we're producing? certainly growing it a little each year um 90 percent of our wine we sell right here directly uh, from the, the farm that's kind of been our, our family's philosophy you know we're not big into the wholesale um we enjoy having you know visitors come to the farm uh whether it's to harvest strawberries blueberries pumpkins christmas trees but the same thing for the uh, the winery. So the customers come to our tasting room. They they try our wines, and hopefully they find something that uh, you know fits their palate, and um, they're able able to purchase it. So in order to really come a lot become a lot larger, you have to get more into the uh, the wholesale uh, and distribution end of it. And we do a small amount to some of the area liquor stores, but again, it's our our mindset, our philosophy is. Is to to you know, you know really um, you know keep it close to home. Market. Yeah, sure, sure. And as far as within Connecticut more broadly, I mean, is there a lot of wine production happening there? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of interest. Um, there's, I think, we're approaching 30 wineries now in the state of Connecticut, and um, that's probably nearly doubled since uh, the I don't know about 10. That's since about 10 years ago when I you know really started getting involved in the industry here. So there's definitely a lot, a lot of interest. That's interesting. I mean, any advice for someone who's looking to get into the winemaking business? 
<laughs> don't do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> what? Um, I don't know. There's, it, it's certainly a wonderful thing. It's a lot of work. If you want to do it, you, you want to do it because, you know, you, it's something you're really interested in. Um, it is a lot of work. Uh, it takes a, a the, in some ways, the winemaking part is the easier part of it. It's the, the, the growth and culture of the, the vineyard and grapes that, that is more, more challenging. So, and then there's the old adage, if, if, if you want to make a small fortune, in, whether it's the winery business or the farming business, you, you better start with a large one. <laughs> Oh, the principles of economics revealed here on the Farm Report. Um, so we have a few more minutes. There's a couple more things I want to cover. But before we shift sure. away from wine, I just want to give you a chance to talk about, um, you know, what are the varieties of wine people can get at the shop? And, um, you know, maybe some what is, what is the cost if people want to purchase a bottle on the farm? Sure. Um, I think we, at any point, we usually try to have about a, a dozen different types. Um, we, we try and make something uh, that will suit everyone. Uh, we certainly have the classic vinifera. We have a Chardonnay, a Pinot Gris, Cab Franc, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. But we make a couple fruit wines from some of the, the fruit crops that we produce also. And um, the best thing, if you check our website, jonesfamilyfarms.com, they're all listed there. Um, can give you a little bit more background on each of them than I really would have time to right now. Sure. And in terms of the price range, uh, they're, they're usually between fifteen and twenty dollars. Is is our kind of the, the medium prices of our, our bottles of wine? Nice, great, great. Well, and I'll have to add that uh, on my list of to dos for the summer when I come for some blueberry and strawberry and picking. Um, make sure to leave enough time to try. <laughs> I don't know a dozen wine varieties. A yeah. tough task, but I'm up to it. Um, <laughs> before we wrap up, I wanted to touch a little bit on um, this topic of farm transition because something that uh, you know I've been thinking about uh, a lot here on the Farm Report and doing some research for uh, American Farmland Trust. And I'm just wondering, you know, how you guys have dealt with it. I, I know your farm has passed down from several generations. So is there kind of a standard transition plan that you guys follow or is it less formal than that? Or how have you guys kind of dealt with those issues of, of farm transition? The farm transition is certainly complicated. Um, I think, I think I'm very fortunate, you know, our family just kind of, the, the overriding philosophy is they, they want to see the farm continue and to try and pass it on to the next generation in, you know, a manner better than that you, you received it in. And, and, it's, and it's a continuous working process. It's not like it's just like one day it goes from one to the other. Um, my grandfather's still, still alive um, and still here and, you know, certainly plays a, plays a role in terms of having opinions on how things should be done. But it's really myself and my father who are actively managing it. And um, I've got three young children, um, and hopefully, you know, their ages from one to seven, they're growing up on the farm. Hopefully one, two, or all of them will or could have some interest in just kind of being brought up in that culture, see what it's like to be part of it. So, um and there's that, there's the management transition of just the everyday workings of it, and then there's the, in some ways, it's complicated, but just dealing with uh, the actual estate issues of how you, you transfer for land, and um, that's always difficult because over time, the uh, how the government, you know, changes the rules and, you know, in, in terms of, you know, gifting estates and moving them forward, so we've We've had to spend a lot of time planning, but it's certainly just just the mindset of the family wanting the the farm to continue to be here is probably the overriding reason why it's it's able to continue as such. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Again, if people want to find out more about the Jones Family Farm, they can see you guys at www.jonesfamilyfarms.com. Plan their future um, picking and tasting trips. Um, and it would be great to have you guys back on the show in a couple of months, maybe uh, talk a little bit more about wine and wine tasting and the other happenings over in Connecticut. Thank you so much. Great. It was my pleasure and anytime. Awesome. And tune in next week. We'll be talking about regional distribution with the folks from Regional Access. Once again, you've listened to The Farm Report. We'll see you next Thursday at 1 o'clock. Thanks for
for listening. Thanks for listening to this program on the Heritage Radio Network. You can find all of our archived programs on heritageradionetwork.com, as well as a schedule of upcoming live shows. You can also podcast all of our programs on iTunes by searching Heritage Radio Network in the iTunes Store. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for up-to-date news and information. Thanks for listening.